It's great to be back at the Ocean GIS Forum. So this year I've got Surly, Paul, Shay, Anna, Shelia, Maddie, and I'd like to start by introducing our student project manager, Emily, to give us a background on the project. Hello. So we, know, we knew from the 2006 and 2007 study conducted by our GIS program that there are high concentrations of heavy metals in the, in the map of the LA Harbor and in the LA River. So when we found a map of California Superfund sites last year and noticed that many of them were close to water sources, we wanted to see how those metals went from our but from their industries to our study area where the heavy metals were tracked. When we saw that, from, when we conducted a downstream trace and we saw that many of the heavy metals ended up in the same study area that the 2007 study had looked at, we decided to take our own samples there and see how the levels had changed over time. So my role in this project was to guide the students and to give them the resources they need to get the job done. So basically pay for things. <laughs> so as the project manager, I requested a boat with a van being grabbed to collect sediment samples with. So I chartered a boat from LA County Office of Education, their floating lab. It had the van being grabbed that the students need, and everything was great until a week before the project, I get this, con you know, this phone call saying, our contracts department doesn't have the contracts ready. You can't go out on the charter when you need to. So I told the students, oh no, we're going to need another boat. I suggested that we contact the Ocean Defenders Alliance, who we've worked with in the past, to see if we could use their boat for our project. The Ocean Defenders Alliance was happy to work with us. They just didn't have a Van Veen grab. So... <clears throat> I found one on Flint, from Flynn Scientific that was under $250. So I ordered the Van Veen Grab, and I paid the expedited shipping so that it would get to us the day before our charter. And I checked on the order like three days out, and I was told, oh no, we forgot, we sent it UPS ground. There's no way it was going to get to us in time. So what we decided to do was to follow the engineering design pro process in order to make our own sediment sampler. So what we did was that we used um, a roll of duct tape and some lead to properly weight the metal bucket uh, so that when it falls onto the bottom of the floor, it would be at a perfect angle to collect the sediments. Um, so I'm very comfortable around boats. I was raised around a bunch of boats, so I volunteered to put on my flotation device and stay on the swim step of the boat. and basically deploy the little collection device that we made. After two tries and not getting any sediment samples, uh, the captain suggested that we take the, um, we throw the bucket in one more time. This time we'll engage the engines and slowly move the boat forward to try and collect samples. When we were pulling it up, we were really excited because it felt heavy. Yet soon it felt a bit stuck. So, looking at the angle of the line, I could see that it was hopelessly wrapped around the propeller and we were dead in the water. And I was hoping I wouldn't have to get in the water in the, you know, at the outfall of the mouth of the LA River. But seeing the way that we had all these other setbacks, I thought, no, it's best, I better bring my dive gear. You just never know. So I had to suit up and get in the water, the LA, LA River, and <laughs> underwater I saw that you know, this line is wrapped all around the props. I had to cut it off to free the engine so we could motor away. Um, and it was obvious the, the bucket was gone. That had gotten ripped off. And it was obvious we weren't going to be doing any sediment collections on, on this day. Our first field trip wasn't a complete failure, to say the least. We learned how important it was to have a contingency plan after a contingency plan. But another thing that made it better was that a professor from the Rio Honda College brought his drone with us and we were using it to get an aerial view of our study area. We, all, we also had a drone, but I forgot to charge it overnight and so we weren't able to use it. 
Um, since I wasn't able to be on drone duty, uh, we used a remotely operated vehicle that we brought to get an underwater view of our surroundings. The water was so murky and just terrible that we weren't able to use our cameras to see what we were actually viewing. But with the use of our sonar, we were able to find nothing particularly interesting except a bunch of fish swimming around and a metal shopping cart. So I was able to reschedule our LA County boat, which is lucky because we happen to have a Glendale News Press LA Times reporter with us on our first trip that just documented everything. And so I, I contacted them and said, hey, can you come out again with us on another charter to give our story a happy ending? And, and they were able to, to do that. So I rescheduled the LA County uh, the boat and I rescheduled the lab that we were using, uh, CSU Long Beach lab, so we were able to get in and do sediment analysis right after our charter. Our next trip was very successful. We were very fortunate to have our photographer and reporter from LA Times Glendale News Press to join us and continue to tell our story. We started in Rainbow Harbor in Long Beach, and as we were sailing along, we noticed that there were many people fishing from the dock. And this was a concern to us because we noticed there were many signs posted saying not to eat the fish from the harbor. And so our GIS program uh, tested tissue samples from this area, and they uh, found biomagnification of arsenic and mercury in our seafood in, along the coast in their 2007 and 2011 research and study. Uh, so we started to use our Van Veen grab that arrived to collect the sediment samples. We were short on time, sadly, so we focused on a series of points of interest based on the knowledge of our boat captain and our previous knowledge. Uh, so then we used survey one, two, three to plot and to put in the locations of where we found our samples. Uh, the points uh, shown are um, classified in depths and amounts by depth. So the crew aboard the ship, they showed Emily and I how to use the Van Veen grab, and after watching them take a few samples, I eventually took over the process, trading off with Emily. And so the way this would work would be after we deployed the Van Veen grab, we would then have to bring it up and take it over to a bucket that was covered and had like a filter on it. So we'd be able to wash out the sediments and then gather a new sample. So from our samples that we gathered, we would then take it and put it in labeled containers. And we had a total of 17 samples. And by the end of that, I was absolutely soaked. And so on the way back to the docks, Emily and I cleaned up after getting all muddy. And we got onto the boat, had a quick lunch, and headed out to Ermi's lab at Cal State University Long Beach to run the ICP MS tests for heavy metals. So as soon as we got the results from our analysis, um, we converted mill milligrams per kilograms to parts per billion, and then went to and then we referred to the NOAA squirts chart uh, to find the safe limits of each metal that we found in our study area. And so then we used Excel to create column charts with the same levels that we found in relationship to the permissible exposure limits, abbreviated PEL. So the P, it's important to note that the PEL is different for each metal. And so then I started to create the maps as the cartographer. So then I used the sample number to join the attribute tables of the sample location with the results of our heavy metal analysis. So then I started on ArcGIS Pro. So then I, uh, using original Krieging, I created interpolation maps and uh, created created the web maps, but then 
I decided to move on to ArcGIS Online. So going on to ArcGIS Online, I uh, used, I interpolated the points and created the web maps for each analysis. Uh, so after we got the results, I was curious to see that like if there are if there are any changes uh, in the levels over the time. So me and my uh, team worked on um, to dig through the 2006 to 2007 uh, levels and uh, I was able to uh, graph uh, similar, um, I was able to uh, graph similar data to the previous project. And so I um, used these graphs uh, in a cascade map, uh, story map. Uh, so for example, as you can see, the uh, cadmium levels uh, have the highest uh, concentration levels in um, in the uh, mouth of the uh, LA Harbor, uh, LA River, and the and their constant and their contamination levels have been decreasing over the time, and like uh, they almost went decreased to like uh, one half since two, uh, since 2007. So if we go to chromium, if you look here, um, the Lev the chromium levels were increased in were pretty high in the near the LA River, but uh, we were we weren't able to sample the LA Harbor because it was closed off because of like construction. But that was the area of most like contamination from t the 2007 study, as shown. Uh, so for lead, uh, lead also had the highest concentration levels uh, near the mouth of the river, and it's. As you can see from the graphs, the old data uh, in the 2017, the contamination levels have been decreasing over time. So if you look at mercury, here you, again you'll see that the levels were actually relatively the same, except there was a spike in the area near Shoreline Marina, and um, there was also in LA Harbor, it was the area with the highest rates, but again we weren't able to sample from LA Harbor. Uh, so nickel uh, levels were pretty much increasing near the marina and also again spiked at the uh, near the LA Harbor the river and and so here for the copper levels the copper levels actually exceeded the PEL for uh, shoreline marina and near the LA River um, and so they, they were actually uh, lower from the study of 2007, as seen here. Uh, so arsenic levels uh, were undetectable for the 2007 uh, study. So uh, well, uh, uh, arsenic levels, uh, like the mercury levels, were, uh, uh, were biomagnifying uh, through the trophic levels. And their uh, concentration levels uh, are pretty much low, as you can see from the graphs. Uh, for silver, actually, it, all the levels were very relatively low, so silver levels actually pose no threat because they show like basically almost no possibility of passing the PEL limit for now. Finally, we have uh, finally we have zinc uh, that ha uh, that was at or pretty much above the PEL from in uh, sample 17 to 20 uh, for uh, to 17 uh, cited samples, and as you can see from the old graphs, the uh, the concentrations have been uh, significantly uh, uh, decreasing uh, since 2007. As Anna stated. Uh, a, a majority of the posters po uh, posted around our study area stated do not consume the fish and for good reason. If a large amount of these uh, heavy metals are consumed, birth defects and other health conditions are inevitable, which is, um, which is good for us, which is not good for us, but it's good information to know because our first responders dive in these areas to con uh, and do practice training and uh, many people unfortunately do consume the fishes. Using the information and the charts and the graphs, I made a poster that was presented at the CalGIS uh, Cal Pro Eurisa conference at Palm Springs and the California STEAM, so California STEAM Showcase. So we shared these maps with first response dive teams as well as with nonprofits that dive in these areas. And in fact, the Los Angeles Police Department has asked us to come and take samples at more of the specific dive spots within the harbor, which we didn't previously have access to. 
So we will be continuing our project and filling in gaps in our data and continuing our analysis. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. <laughs>